alongside late Pine 64 blog, Pine Talk this month is coming to you a bit later. Well, a lot later as well. Hip hip er hooray. My name's Brian or 33YN2. And I am Justin, but you may know me as the big time developer, Porky of the Pine. Now we're not quite sure how this episode's going to go. We're both pretty low energy. Um, so it might be short, uh, but we might actually find a way to ramble and uh, get a good amount of time in the, into this episode. But I know we have a lot to talk about with Rapid Fire, so let's get into that. Nemo Mobile now has working phone calls without audio, but progress is progress. Pine64 has just released a new bug tracker for software issues across all of its devices. Arch Linux Arm has followed Mobian and Postmarket OS in making the switch to Toboot with its newest PinePhone Pro image. SXMO version 1.9.0 was released. This features profiles for different devices, so, so it's not just limited to the PinePhone and PinePhone Pro anymore. Pipewire is now the default audio driver. The in-call menu has been significantly improved. And SuperD has been added, which should improve the overall reliability of all daemons. Porky of the Pine of Pine Talk fame wrote a complete guide on customizing colors in the Sway variant of SXMO, but he didn't stop there. He also wrote a script to automatically apply the color changes after the user sets them within that script. But he kept on going. He then added support for customizing the colors in SXMO's X11 variant within Postmarket OS tweaks, and as of recording, he does not believe that adding support for the Wayland variant will be possible due to how colors are defined in Sway and how Postmarket OS tweaks is written. Man, this Porky guy sounds really cool. I kind of want to meet him one day, maybe play RuneScape with him or something. Sounds like fun. BigTorg modem firmware version 0.6.5 has released with a couple of fixes and a few new features. We'll include links so that you can see the full changelog. Lumiri, the Ubuntu Touch UI, has been seeing lots of movement and was likely to be included in Postmarket OS. Speaking of Postmarket OS, version 21.12 Service Pack 5 was released. This features your boys update to Postmarket OS tweaks and newer kernels for both Snapdragon 845 and Snapdragon 820 devices. Our lord and savior Meggy has debugged the cameras on the PinePhone Pro and got them working. Unfortunately, megapixels still need to add support in order for the cameras to really work, but we're 10 steps closer. That said, you could still use a command line to play around with capturing images. Bluetooth HFP 1.8 support is being added to Pulse Audio so that Linux phones can integrate with car multimedia systems and HFP compatible headsets for calls. And finally, community member Counterpillow came to our rescue to give us some news on the SPC side of Pine64 products. In his words, the RK3566 is getting bludgeoned into shape by the community. While progress is being made, it still lacks a driver for the 4K H264, HEVC, and VP90 coder. 10-bit decoding on the RK3328 and 3399 may be coming soon, and several developers have received their Quartz Pro 64 RK3588 boards, and thanks to them being similar to the EVB evaluation board, mainlining is already underway. Thank you, Counterpillow, for the information on the happenings in the SBC world. If you're a listener and feel like we skip out on a lot of what you feel is big news, let us know in Discord, Matrix, or by email. Something I'd like to note is that we do read our emails now. Um, we weren't so great at doing that in the past, um, but for all of our episodes going on forwards, uh, we will make sure to check what's going on. Um, thankfully, we haven't gotten much in the way of email. Uh, quite frankly, we've got like maybe four pieces of mail from people. Um, it, it's mostly just uh, spam and uh, you know fun stuff. So. If you have anything to uh, tell us or you have any questions to ask, then you can definitely send us an email. We will reply to it and give you an answer. Um, or uh, if it's something that you want included in the show, if it's you know relevant and we can fit it in, then we will. If we get enough, we can actually probably even have a segment on it within the podcast. Yeah, uh, we could even uh, create a wall of emails in the pin it to our podcast uh, imaginary wall i'll put them all i'll print them all out and put them above my desk look at them every day smile so many of you will know of firefox os uh, or at least have heard of it and know that it's pretty much dead uh, I, I, well it is dead i don't think that there's any continuation of it anymore from uh, mozilla at all However, the community has uh, forked it and continued working on it. There's been various WebOS projects over the years. Uh, a recent project called Kaploon 
is continuing on Firefox OS effectively for the Pine Phone, well, and also other devices as well. It's not just the Pine Phone, but they just released a uh, package for Mobian that you can install Kaploon's web-based OS on there and test it out on your Pine Phone. So give it a roll if you're interested. We'll include a link down in the show notes. And speaking of Mobian, I recently found out that Jonah, a Plasma Mobile developer, has been maintaining a Plasma Mobile repository for Debian, which means Mobian in the case of the Pine Phone. It's, I think that's super cool to see, and I think it will, and although I think I will stick to Arch Linux ARM from Danked or Postmarket OS, it's really nice to have more options. Another little interesting tidbit for you before I move on to more meteor information is that TuxPhones.com released an article from an author named Raphael. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that I right. Think it's Raphael. Uh, yell at me, Raphael. R- Raphael. Raphael. Yes, okay. that's the typical pronunciation of it. Okay, well, yell at us in the comments if we uh, are pronouncing that wrong. So this article on TuxPhones.com talks about in setting up a wireless secondary monitor on a Linux phone. And it seems to actually have a pretty decent amount of latency and seems to work pretty well. So it doesn't seem like a bad solution if you're needing to have a tiny extra display to show something on. Uh, obviously the phone screen is gonna be very small, so I don't think it's very practical, but hey, you could do it. And I mean, honestly, maybe a Pine tab, for example, could make this a lot more useful, you know, a bigger screen there. Um, well, we'll include a link in the show notes if you want to check that out. Madame Malady on GitHub has released two really handy installers for those of you who may not know how to install and run Moai Shell or Wagedroid on your PinePhone Pro. Um, these installers are specifically for Manjaro ARM, uh, but a lot of people use that. It shipped with a lot of the PinePhones, so I don't think that's too much of an issue there. Um, these should make setting up and installing those a breeze and it will be a great thing for those of you who might not be too technical and know how to export the environment variables and whatnot needed to get Moai Shell working properly. Um, further, there's also a guide from another community member on setting up a CH root environment for running Box86 and Box64. We'll include links, of course, for those in the show notes. So honing back to the Plasma Mobile mention, you know, Plasma Mobile on Mobian, I did want to mention that I played around with my PinePhone Pro running Manjaro Plasma Dev again. I updated a few days ago. And I wanted to see how it was faring. As you know, I've talked about Plasma Mobile in the past. And I mean, I do have a lot of praise for it, but it has had a lot of issues. uh, And there's still a lot of missing features that I would like to see implemented. Um, Thankfully, the latest updates to the Git release, you know, the Git branch of Plasma Mobile have been really, really nice. Uh, A lot of the bugs have been fixed. Angelfish, the browser, is working perfectly now, as far as I can tell. Um, For example, YouTube, which used to funk out when you tried to go into full screen, is now working perfectly, and you can get out of full screen. You can play the video. It works smoothly. The shell itself is working fine. The launcher is remembering the position of apps. Everything seems to be working pretty well in terms of the general usage of the UI. The only thing that I've seen is a few hiccups with the virtual keyboard, which is not a big deal because you can open and close it and then it's fine again. So being able to control the call from the lock screen with a dialer pad and being able to put it in the speaker and mute the call, those things are something that Fosh has implemented. And Plasma Mobile still needs those things. It's still missing it. The only thing it gives you is a hang up button and an answer button on the lock screen, which is not, you know, great. It also does not give you the ability to see alarms from the lock screen right now as it stands. So if you want to manage your alarm, you have to unlock the device fully in order to do anything. It'd be nice like Fosh to have a UI that pops up on the lock screen, allowing you to snooze and hang, uh, stop or hang the alarm up um, alongside calls, you know, doing management like that. But as it stands, it is shaping up very, very nicely. And I think in another update or two, it will be in a pretty stable shape. I I mean, stable as in usable shape for daily driver. It's already stable, I would say, actually. Like I said, I've been using it for a little while. I just updated and it's running really stable. So I do want the listeners who have heard the past two or three episodes to know that the smart speaker that I've been referencing 
is actually something that I am in the works of talking to possibly make an actual Pine64 product out of. Uh, that hasn't been a joke. Well, it initially was a joke, but at this point it is something that is seriously happening. I've spoken with Lucas about it, and my goal is to create the basic hardware and some sort of firmware and then see just where I can go from there. Um, but there is one glaring issue with all of it, and that's that uh, I don't know the first thing about any of it. I just recently received a Pinecone BL602, uh, so yes, I am putting a Pinecone in the Pinecone, um, but the name Pinecone as a smart speaker is definitely not final and is likely not going to be a thing. I'm just going to call it that because for now it's just my own personal project. But to do any of that, I have to first learn Embedded C, write a few simple apps, and then see if my memes can be dreams. I'm currently getting a lot of help from both Electrolyte and Thanos the Tank Engine, but I'm currently on a crash diet, which has completely killed my motivation, which is part of why we're so low energy, or at least I'm so low energy in this recording. Uh, so progress may be slow, but there certainly will be progress. I really hope by the recording of the next podcast, I'll have some news to actually provide towards the actual progress of that project. Yeah, hopefully by this time uh, next month that you'll have a nuclear reactor going too to power it and everything. Um, I expect you to build it from scratch though, and uh, I expect to hear lots of progress. Yeah, it'll be a FOSS nuclear reactor. Oh, nice. Yeah. So, hey, didn't you have to go through like hoops for the regulation on uh, uranium and stuff? Yeah, but it was the same hoops that I had to jump through for the unicorn, so yeah, I'm just used to it now. So Brian, while we were typing up the script, you did mention that you're now using Graphene OS on your phone. And you are kind of wanted to talk a bit about that, but uh, we kind of left it up in the air on the script. So yeah, tell me about the world of a degoogled phone, because I switched back to my Android phone from the Pine phone for a while, and I'm still on the proprietary OnePlus Oxygen OS. Yeah, so I was originally planning on using a Pine phone as the way back before the pine phone pro of course you know just the regular pine phone which was slow and had very limited ram and storage and all that but i was willing to overlook the issues with it because i figured you know the software is going to get worked out in no time right i mean look at gnome and kde and you know all these flat pack projects and i don't know you know all the all the open source projects that have been going on in the past few years in the linux space it's you know things have just they start up and then like within a few months they have a huge amount of progress and i was figuring the same thing would happen with a uh, mobile linux which it did it's just that i was expecting it to be a huge amount of progress to the point where it could be fully usable and i could just throw away my android phone and forget it i started off with a cheap android phone um it, that was you know what i was just using i never went into expensive territory with those uh, i always felt like they were crap and uh you know even the expensive ones eventually you know stuff happens to them and they're no longer that great to use uh, but, well, I decided the Pine phone was going to be a great experience, yada, yada. Flash forward uh, a year, and it was still not really up to par. Even with Fosh, it still had issues with, like, reliability of calls and whatnot. Uh, like, for example, when it goes into sleep, it sometimes won't wake up for a call or something. You'll miss a call. Uh, battery life is not that great, even on the original Pine phone. Like, it's okay, don't get me wrong, but it's not as good as an Android phone, so... It was a huge step down for me in that regard, um, which I guess I should have expected, you know, to be, you know, these things coming in. But I had this illusion of things being a lot more fleshed out in a short period of time than they were. And so what happened was I ended up getting dissatisfied with it. It was not working for me. GPS was a major issue, for example. I just couldn't, you know, use GPS on that. I mean, I, you could use the secondary phone, like my old Android phone I could have used for GPS and called it a day there. Uh, but then still the call reliability issues, the battery life being only a couple hours, you know, I would have to charge it each day rather than it lasting like two days on my other Android phone that I had. Um, so yeah, these things added up and overall it made for the fact that I did not want this uh, device as my uh, daily driver. Um, but I did love the idea of having an open source phone that doesn't spy on me, that doesn't track me, that I have full control over and customization and I can play around with like running Python on it, for example, if I wanted to. And uh, that's something that I continue to want now. And so over time, I went from 
the Android phone to, uh, I got a OnePlus 6 for really cheap and uh, replaced the battery on that. And then started playing around with uh, Linux on that because I heard from uh, Caleb actually that, uh, who, who, by the way, if you don't know, he's now a mod on the Pine64 Discord. He's also a developer that does a lot of mainlining uh, efforts for like the Snapdragon processors and stuff uh, to get them working with Linux. But yeah, he told me that there was a good amount of progress on that device, the OnePlus 6 and 6T, and that it was uh, pretty much ready for like use uh, for, you know, general phone calls and stuff like that um it 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 is pretty close to that but it's still again the same thing with the pine phone pretty much it's on the same kind of tier it's uh, a lot faster but it's got issues like for example charging and you know battery life and stuff like that are still a problem there uh the earpiece isn't working uh i believe gps isn't working uh so that kind of stuff adds up as well um so i you know i still have that device it's a lot of fun to play around with for because of the much faster performance than a pine phone even a pine phone pro it still you know outperforms that but that's because it has a like a flagship processor from a couple of years back um so it's a fun toy it's not a daily driver device i kept looking um the one plus i started using android on um, i installed lineage onto it uh, which i didn't know about micro g at the time like I, I mean i knew about it i didn't know how it worked so i tried installing micro g on it because i wanted to get some google apps and I found that you have to actually uh, install a custom ROM or do some patches to Lineage uh, in order to get Micro G working because it requires signature spoofing. And I went down a rabbit hole and learned that signature spoofing actually can cause security issues because what it is effectively is it allowing an application on an Android phone to spoof itself as another app. So effectively Micro G spoofing itself as Google Play services in order to replace it and act as it. Uh, but that means it opens a security hole. It's not a, not a great uh, solution. And also you need to custom patch the ROM. Lineage does not come with uh, signature spoofing enabled, so you have to custom patch it. There's a fork of Lineage that enables uh, you know, that kind of uh, functionality, but it was not something I was aware of at the time. So I continued using Lineage OS on my OnePlus 6. It was a great experience, I'll say, a few th but the, the few things I couldn't get um, you know, my banking app wouldn't work. Uh, I believe uh, I tried Steam and that wasn't working. Uh, there was a couple other apps I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but they were important ones for me at least. And those wouldn't work without having Micro G or something else. So I also had issues with updates. It was taking a while uh, to get updates because um, I guess the OnePlus 6 is not really a priority for getting, you know, updates and whatnot. And, uh, Apparently, when the biggest thing is that when you have an update on uh, the OnePlus 6 port, at least that I have, you have to literally plug it into your computer uh, and then run uh, the fastboot commands and, and whatnot to get it reflashed with the new image. You can't just use an updater to update the whole ROM and be done. So um, I started looking for a phone and I found a, a slight discount on a Google Pixel uh, 5a. And I know Google, uh, horrible, but it wasn't, uh, I didn't get it because of the, like the, like Google and all that. No, it's, uh, the reason is, is because, uh, Google pixels have the best ROM support pretty much like they're, you know, they run almost any ROM out there. I believe in even lineage. Um, so graphene OS, uh, Calyx, and those are major ROMs and they have a lot of privacy features. They have a lot of security features. They're open source. Um, Calyx, I did a lot of research on, I decided it wasn't really for me because it uses by default a few things, uh, like signal, for example, uh, which is, don't get me wrong is okay, but it, I would rather have just a normal native open source, uh, you know, SMS app installed rather than relying on, uh, you know, signal for SMS, which is what Calyx does. Um, so like a few things like that are a bit wonky. And it doesn't have as many security patches as graphene and uh, the micro G situation. Uh, line, uh, so Calyx relies on micro G to provide Google compatibility. So you can run like a few apps here and there that you know you might need like your banking app. Um, and the thing is, is that it's just not as micro G is just not as, you know, secure or private as say, just running uh, Google 
play services inside a container environment and just limiting it to only the apps that you install and that's it. It doesn't have any other access to your phone. It can't do anything else that it, you don't want it to. And that's actually the approach that the Graphene OS devs have implemented. They've added a, a sandbox environment that tightly restricts the access that Google Play and all the apps that are attached to that have access. So in the end, you have way more privacy, you have a lot more security, and uh, it works really well. So you still have a you know, de-Googled phone effectively. You can add on top of that whatever apps you need, like your banking app, or, and you still have a pretty high level of security and privacy. Um, so I've been pretty satisfied with Graphene. It runs really well. It's, it's highly snappy. I know I heard people in the, uh, saying that in the past it had performance issues compared to like Calyx and other ROMs. Um, but I've it, seeing it now, it, it's snappy as heck now. And, uh, I haven't had any issues with performance. Um, there is a few funky issues here and there with like, say, uh, I don't know, my banking app, for example, which does rely on Google services and whatnot. It sends like double notifications every so often. Like if I send it, if I get an SMS, uh, confirmation through it, it will send two notifications, uh, for whatever reason. Um, uh, those are kind of minor things to me though. So I really don't care, but yeah, just small little bugs with the container system that it uses. But overall, it's been a really great experience. And in the end of the day, while this is not a Linux phone, you can still do some interesting stuff with it. Um, well, first of all, there's a lot of really great apps that you just can't find on the Linux phone side yet because Linux phone is, you know, are so new. Um, for example, one uh, app I found was like a Reddit client uh, called Infinity, and uh, it has a lot of good features. It's almost a full com replacement for the uh, official Reddit app, actually, and it's uh, really, really fast and it works really well. Um, but aside from that, the other thing is that you can install, say, Terminix. I believe it's called Terminix. I, I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's Termux. Termux, yeah. Yeah. So you can install Termux onto an Android phone and you can get access to a full Linux container environment, basically. So you can run Python, for example, or whatever command line application you need, and it's right on your Android phone. So Google phone with privacy and security patches, uh, which, mind you, a Google phone, at least compared to the current state of Linux mobile, is a lot more secure because of the sandboxing and, uh, you know, the locked bootloader and stuff like that. That's a big thing for security. Um, so that, and the, you know, the added benefit of being able to run a few apps from uh, Linux mobile in a container environment means that I'm pretty satisfied with this. Um, I definitely would prefer a native Linux phone experience in the future with like Plasma mobile, or maybe honestly, Lomiri would be ideal for me with like a, you know, a normal, I don't know, post-market OS base underneath, uh, instead of Ubuntu touch for basic, for example, so, yeah. Ubuntu touch. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> soon. <laughs> but because Ubuntu Touch constantly gets out of date, like they're they're still on Ubuntu 16.04, which I have nothing against them. You know, they're doing their best work that they can, but it means that there are multiple versions behind the latest Ubuntu LTS release. And also because of their approach of, uh, you know, making the file system read only, you cannot use app to install software without possibly breaking the system, uh, which I think is a very big, con i mean i would love to be able to you know run unity get all the ubuntu touch apps but then also have access to post market os repositories and you know the terminal and all that fun stuff without you know any issues with the file system so but hopefully in time uh, i mean already the pine phone pro for example is seeing huge progress the camera uh, are just around the corner for support Unity is being ported to uh, post market OS, so that's going to be something that will come soon, I'm sure. And uh, with, with all those things coming along, I don't think um, this is my personal opinion. I don't think that security uh, is ever going to be as good uh, as you know an Android device that's locked down with you know a de googled Android device, I should say, because you know security and privacy is equally important, right? Um, I don't think it's a uh, Linux phone is ever going to be as good as that because of all the, uh, you know, bootloader permissions and security protocols and sandboxing and all that fun stuff that Android does. Uh, you know, they also use XC Linux uh, underneath as well on top of all that. 
Um, so yeah, it, it's pretty dang secure. Um, uh, Linux mobile probably will be decent at least. It won't be terrible. It will be a lot better than running an ancient version of Android. That's for sure. You know, like with a three dot whatever kernel that hasn't had a patch in like five years. You know, but uh, it's still not probably ideal compared to you know modern Android. But I'm looking forward to where it goes. Uh, I, I mean, like I said, I would really love to get my hands on, you know, a phone that runs full Linux. I can just do whatever the heck I want. Plug it into a computer mod. That's the biggest thing for me. An Android phone cannot hook into a monitor and be used as a full-blown computer without, you know, literally just blowing up Android into a big screen and, you know, being ugly and all that, right? It's just like literally Android scaled up. That's all it is. That's, you know, Android phones do not, like, resize the whole UI and add in a, a desktop environment type uh, interface and still allow you to run, you know, the terminal and all that. And then, um, you know, run full desktop software. That's just not a thing. They they let you run Android apps from the Android store and they blow up the uh, the launcher, for example, onto a bigger screen and, that, and they add a few buttons and that's it. That's the gist of it pretty much for Android being convergent. But Linux Mobile is a whole different story. They literally take the UI, they re like, well, okay, Plasma Mobile, for example, doesn't uh, blow it up. It, uh, and it, they're going to be making it so it, uh, you know, launches a new session with its own bar and everything. But yeah, uh, Fosh and Plasma Mobile, they literally essentially become a bigger screen and they have the same features as mobile, but also they, uh, you know, because they're, Linux, they also have desktop software you can run. So you literally run the same software. It's desktop and mobile. No difference. It's just a larger screen. It has more buttons, UI options. Bob's your uncle. You could do whatever the heck you want. You can run Box 86, Box 64, run all the software you need. You just can't do that on Android. Yeah, so as you know, I did daily drive my Pine phone for about a year. Um, and the only reason why I stopped was mostly just because it was it became kind of inconvenient for me to use things like Discord and stuff with um, Postmarket OS and SXMO. Uh, and we are getting really close to me going back to the Pine phone. The only thing that I'm waiting on is uh, Wagerwide to work on Postmarket OS, which there was recently an update which should have gotten it working. And I know I can run the container, but right now I am not getting an actual image. Um, I don't know if that's something just on my part or if there is more things that I need to do, or if there is just something wrong with it. But once that happens, I'm going back to the Pine phone, uh, and then I'm just going to daily drive my Pine phone until the Pro becomes uh, more usable. And then once that happens, I'm going to use my Pro, and I'll be very happy with the Pro, because uh, SXMO runs really smoothly on the Pro. Um, at least the Wayland version. Actually, I think both both of them do. I haven't missed too much on um, X11 on the pro but i do know on the og pine phone wayland already runs super smooth so actually having a little bit of oomph under the hood that will definitely do loads for the entire experience um but i guess on the note of android phones uh, i first did want to mention that when you said when you brought up the google pixel um i am under the belief that all the telemetry and the google bad stuff is actually coming from like the, the top people at Google, whereas the actual developers and the people who work on the phone are more like us, and that's why they design it in such a way that makes it very easy or very easy to um, add different images and uh, and de Google it and uh, or root it really. Um, but like I said when I first introduced this whole thing, uh, I did switch back to my OnePlus 6T. Um, and I haven't bothered with de-googling or even rooting it or anything, um, but I have been meaning to. It sounds like using my OnePlus for that is a bad idea. Is that correct? No, actually, it would be decent. Just keep in mind that, you know, updates you'll have to do from the command line uh, on your computer, you know, using Fastboot, uh, you know, the Android tools and Fastboot and all that. Um, and literally, you know, when it says it's time to update to the next major version, you know, because minor version releases, it will do right in the UI and update it automatically and everything. But for major releases, it will require you to literally install it from scratch again. Uh, so, 
well, I don't know if it, over, it, it probably doesn't overwrite your apps and data uh, when you do it for an update, but uh, yeah, it's, you'll still need to plug it into your computer and run the commands and, you know, it's obviously not ideal. But uh, I think honestly, that's a worthy trade-off for some privacy benefits and also performance and getting new patches and, and UI uh, like features and stuff like that. Because uh, the newer Androids, uh, you know, versions add quite a new a few new features and options that are pretty nice to have. Yeah, I think I'm still on what I'm on Oxygen OS 10 because I don't want to upgrade to 11. It's I've had the notification there for I don't know how many months now. Um, because I know that it completely ruins what made Oxygen OS good. And so I I might as well at this point just switch to uh, Lineage or Graphene uh, if Graphene does work on the 6C or if there is an image for Graphene. So I do not think so. But you, okay, Lineage yeah. OS on its own with MicroG would be perfect. Uh, and yeah, that you can get a MicroG version of uh, Lineage for the uh, 6T. So you'd be good on yeah. that. Yeah. It's not as good as graphene, but it's way better than any stock Android. And, uh, you know, honestly, it's not a big deal not to be as good as graphene. It's good enough. Yeah, and, and using Oxygen OS, not only do you get the telemetry from Google, but you also get the telemetry from OnePlus, which I have, as far as I know, openly said that they do track what users do. Um, and I do know what I have, because I, I, re- I, I fairly regularly use Google Discover for news and stuff like that. Um just yeah if i need to mindlessly scroll at least i'm mindlessly scrolling through news articles rather than random pictures or whatnot i don't really use social media anyway but i have definitely gotten news articles related to conversations that i've had or even there was a few times where i've mentioned something on discord and then i get an article related to that and i hate that i i was much happier daily driving my fine phone and using the google discover um news feed and just getting based off of the browsing that i let it see me do rather than me just randomly doing stuff and um so yeah i'm I'm most likely actually probably this weekend um if i get bored enough and i have enough energy i'll probably just commit to uh installing lineage os at micro g yeah sounds good uh, do keep in mind you won't have access to that Google Discover anymore, and you won't have uh, the voice assistant built into the keyboard anymore. But uh, you, first of all, there's an open source keyboard you can install that has a voice assistant uh, built into it. Uh, you can find that in the Updroid anyway. store. So, huh? Yeah. I don't use a voice assistant anyway, so... Ah, well, uh, aside from that, though, you can also ins- just install a, a feed reader. Uh, you know, There's a, a really good one that I could recommend. Uh, I... I uh, think it's called Nunti. Uh, Nunti. N N U N T I, uh, and it uh, is an RSS feed reader that has some smart capabilities. It learns what you're reading, and then it shows you articles based off of that. And it's completely open source as well. So that is actually something I would definitely look into, because um, yeah, I I like RSS feeds or RSS readers. I use Newsboat regularly, and if it's at least somewhat smart and looks at what I or if, yeah, if it takes what I look at and gives me more articles on that, I would be very happy. And I don't honest. think it gives you more articles, but it, it based off of the RSS uh feeds that you have added to it, it will uh sort the articles for you, basically. Okay. Yeah. So it'll choose what to prioritize. Okay. Yeah. And and they're the good thing is if I'm looking at like political news, um the source that I use for that is one of those that has sources from, or it uses several sources. So um, it's just kind of like a, uh, I don't want to say like a meta engine, but I guess that's the best word I can think of. It, it compiles just a bunch of um, articles from, uh, I, don't, I don't know how many sources, but uh, it's definitely got a lot. And so it, it would be interesting to see how it sorts that kind of stuff. But yeah. So with that, I guess it's time to end this episode. We actually were able to get a little meat into it and actually make it a decent, decently long episode. I don't know if it's a decent episode. You guys tell us whether you think it was good or bad or um, anything that you want us to improve or you know, change. Uh, we are very open to feedback, just like what I mentioned earlier. 
um, with counter pillows uh, suggestions. He came to us in the discord um, asking if we only talk about pine phones and um, it's what we know the most, but it definitely isn't all we want to talk about. And I do plan on talking a lot more about the BL602 and then possibly even looking into uh, Pine Dio stack and the BL604 uh, to if that becomes relevant at all with things that I do. But um, I definitely want this, or we both want this to be um, not the Pine Phone podcast, but the Pine64 podcast. Uh, so if you have any suggestions or if you have um, things that you want us to talk about, definitely message us, send us an email. Um, the email is pinetalk at pine64.org, right? Yeah, pinetalk at pine64.org. Yeah, and um, our usernames on Discord and Matrix are 33YN2 and Porky of the Pine. Um, and yeah, you can always just message us. I'm always around. And uh, yeah, uh, if you don't have anything else, Brian, I think I covered everything. Uh, just so you know, you can also uh, toot us at uh, Mastodon if you want to. Uh, well, Fossodon at talkpine at fossodon.org. Or you can tweet to us at talkpine as well. And of course, you can send Carrier Pigeon, but uh, just do note that there is a large delay between us receiving a Carrier Pigeon mail and you sending it. Yeah. So yeah, you might not get that mail read until the episode after you send it, or two episodes after you send it. But yeah, Brian, if you don't have anything, uh, I think it's good to end it. Till next time. <laughs>